if you can go back and talk to your 20 something year old self for about 60 seconds, and then you're going to disappear. What would you say to that young man? I would probably grab myself by the shoulders and say, uh, listen, man, it's not about the money. Why is that? I think it's been proven time and time again that uh, it's not the path to happiness. There are yeah. different routes that you can take. And I definitely chased, you know, high paying careers in my earlier life once I got yeah. out of the Marine Corps and didn't waste time, but uh, it could have been better served, I think, if I could do it over again. Okay. Yeah, I, I think whenever we get to look back, right, look backwards, the beauty is, it's like we now have information that we would have definitely appreciated. Um, but I always I always ask guys, like, do you think you would have even listened to yourself giving you uh, that piece of advice? I I think if my my older self time traveled and told me I might I might listen <laughs> but uh if somebody else told me in that in that uh that chapter of my life I don't think I'd have paid any attention. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I I think that that's part of the problem man is the fact that me and you right now are sitting on this podcast um uh, talking to some young men tuning in guys who are longing for something they're aching to become the men that god created them to be they are where they are right now but they see that man uh clearly in the future and they're like man i just if i could just be more blank um but ultimately man like th these are just words um that sometimes can fall on deaf ears if we don't have the intentionality to to really follow through on them would you agree agreed yeah yeah so i mean it, it sounds like there was some like you said, maybe not wasted time, but better the time that you could have spent uh, a little bit better. What is it that you're doing now that you feel like um, meets or satisfied that need that you weren't doing before? I think uh, the big shift came when I sort of adopted a more minimalist lifestyle. I okay. was uh, more seeking like jobs with long hours and high pay and what I suppose society would consider material success. Um, there was a time where I lived in a big house on an acreage and um, I just wasn't happy. So I decided to get rid of the house, minimize big time, uh, move down to a one acre place with a, with a small house and a, a workshop uh, that I converted into a wood shop. So uh, the first step was definitely just minimizing my material possessions so that my life's overhead wasn't so high. Yeah, And then uh, it doesn't take as much money to sustain yourself, you know, and your bills. If you, if you set up your life in such a way where you're living debt free, and uh, that really opens up the door to just um, time freedom, which is what I value most now. I would rather work some and have, you know, all of my basic needs met and sort of be, you know, you're, you're still putting away stuff as a nest egg and like making smart financial decisions. But at the same time, the main goal for me now is just time freedom, being able yeah. to go to archery events, being able to go on hunts whenever I want, being able to, you know, enjoy time with my family and uh, not having the pressure of that just looming 50 to 60 hour work week. Yeah. You know, one of the most disturbing books I've read uh, this year, I think was a four hour work week. Have you ever heard of it by Tim Ferriss? I have. Yeah, yeah, I have, have you read it? Years ago. Okay. It's, yeah. you, you know, it's, it was disturbing because it pointed to so many truths that you don't want to admit because it makes you feel like you are, whatever you're doing is just not the right thing. Right. Because he says things like, Hey, busyness is laziness. And you're like, well, well that doesn't make any sense. Cause if I'm busy, that means I'm not lazy. Like, no, if you're busy, that means you have not found the systems that you need to put in place to not be, uh, like the point of failure in the system. Like if you were removed from that, everything else will crumble. And that's like, that's a lot of things in my life right now. Right. Like I'm seeing that actually if systems, and uh, minimalizing a, a footprint has much more of an impact on what I want to see out of life than adding more things and adding more people or adding more, putting more of my time uh, into something um, to keep it alive. Does that make sense? Definitely. You're basically just exchanging your, your time and your busyness for consumption of material goods that you yeah. don't really need in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. So now... <laughs> I think that there's some guys listening though, that that might be, that might sound a little disturbing to, because, you know, we grow up having a room to ourselves, uh, having all of the toys that we want, maybe, maybe not all of us, but like adequate comforts. And for the guys listening that are like, well, I, I didn't grow up in that. I grew up in the hood. Okay. Let me go back 
a little bit and tell you, no, I grew up in Dominican Republic with like a tin roof over my head and like mice crawling on my ceilings and like cockroaches coming into my mouth. You know what I mean? Like that was my upbringing. You're like in America, like dogs have air conditioning when you put them in doggy daycare. (laughs) So (laughs) I don't want to hear it. (laughs) So I, I think, you know, naturally we have just a more comfortable lifestyle. So to approach this idea that, hey, we can minimalize things in our life, um, even minimalize how much we think we need in our lives, and that actually will create some freedom. Uh, sounds a sounds a little backwards. What what in you said, hey, okay, enough is enough. I'm going to make this plunge. I think. That, by the way, we li- I live right by the train track, so if you get a little bit of train in the background, uh, they'll pass in no time. But it's uh, all natural. I think the the big shift really comes when you understand that you're not depriving yourself of any of those comforts. Mm. Like I still live in a comfortable place. You know, we have all the basic amenities, we have all of our needs met, but we're just not living in a way that is, um, I guess, unnecessarily, you know, lavish for no other reason than just to do it. I mean, there've been plenty of studies that have been done, large scale studies that show that, you know, your happiness can't actually increase any more past having your basic needs met and having some money being put away. I think the threshold that they found was like 75,000 household income. Uh, Once you get past that, all you're really doing is trading your time for fancier things. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm still not depriving myself. I'm just not um, chasing, I guess, materialism that uh, uh, I mean, puts me in indebted servitude to, you know, full-time employment and things like that or right. debt for that matter. Yeah. And that, I got to agree with you. Right. I, and I want to jump into some of the adventures and some of the things that you've been able to do in your life um, here in a bit, but just as, as we kind of put a cap on, on this part of the conversation, like I get you, I moved out of a four bedroom house and into a 40 foot RV with three children and a dog, right? Like we, we did the camper thing for two years and you're absolutely right, man. Like I came home, I would come home from vacations. You know, we might go see family or whatever, we'd come into our camper. And like, I felt rich. Like I would walk and be like, we have literally everything we need in 395 square feet. How is that? How did we get yeah. and, and then we came to realize like, we didn't even use most of our house, right? We only had We had two children at the time before we moved into the RV and they shared a room. So we had a guest bedroom and office, which my dog took up. So I had essentially a a room for my dog, you know, two car garage. Uh It it just just got crazy. So you're right, man. But there are pressures. There's pressures that make us, especially um, young men today that make us feel like we need to measure up, right? We need to, you know, they call it keep up with the Joneses. Um, Absolutely. That we we see that guy, our buddy from high school on Instagram, riding the new Dodge charger. I don't know if that's like a cool car. I'm not like a car guy. Uh, seems like a cool car. Uh, <laughs> we see the guy in the Camaro. That's a cool car. Um, and w- we don't measure up because we're still riding in that hoopty Honda Civic, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Do you see any issues with that? I think, I think it's probably just an illusion really at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, nice things bring you a certain surge of happiness, I suppose, to own those things and to try to keep up with the Joneses and to have everything that your neighbor has. But at the end of the day, I mean, does it really affect their, their happiness overall? Eventually that, uh, that brand new Dodge Charger or Camaro is going to be a hoopty. And then what, then you have to purchase the next thing to get the dopamine rush of the new thing or or maybe you have to, you know, lease the car and trade it in every, every couple of years. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's, it's just an illusion. And it's, it's the illusion of materialism that, you know, all of the ancient texts and the, the Bible have warned us about. Yeah. And we, we know that they don't lead to happiness, but there's definitely societal pressure, especially since now, not only do we have to keep up with the Joneses, but we have to keep up with everyone on social media. Yeah. There will always be it's just all day long and influx being bombarded by people who have more, who are more, who are more successful, who are better looking. It just, it never ends. So I think it causes a lot of uh, stress for young men and mental health issues, just comparing themselves, not only to their neighbors, but the entire world. Yeah. 
That's that's so true, man. I heard Brene Brown once say that right now what we're doing is we're comparing ourselves to to so many people and we never actually measure up and we we glorify extraordinary. Right? Like there's no more being an ordinary man isn't cool anymore. Now it's all about like you know, how many backflips can you do on a on this crazy huge, you know, um 250 or 450, you know, motocross bike, like, are you, you're the, you identify with the things that you do, right? Like, are you this badass, you know, bow hunter, right? Like everybody's got to be epic. It's like, no dude, like you can just be really good at just being you and that that's okay. Right. Like, definitely. yeah. And um, maximizing your own personal talents. That's good. You might not be able to do a double backflip on a dirt bike, but you probably have some other talent that if you, really focused in and, uh, you know, exercised your full willpower, you'd probably be able to do some pretty amazing things with whatever things you're gifted with as an individual. Yeah. Yeah. Now, do you feel like you were, uh, you had that, uh, sort of upbringing where somebody around you was encouraging to, to do that, to like pursue your giftings, to push it, press into something that, um, really that you're aspiring to do. That's an aspiration. That is, uh, a purposeful, um, kind of calling within you? I think so. Yeah. Um, it did morph over the years, but, uh, I've always been very much into art, like drawing okay. and painting and sculpting and just different forms of, of art. And so my family was very supportive. Um, I had a great support system in the small public school that I went to. There was, yeah. a, um, an art teacher that was, you know, really, uh, interested in helping me out and propelling me forward. And she would like get me into art shows and just like spend a lot of extra time to sort of hone my skills. And, uh, um, really it ended up, you know, all this, it wasn't really pressure, but it, it was kind of pressure to me as a young kid. It sort of burnt me out from the art thing. Okay. So I graduated high school, kind of stopped, you know, joined the Marine Corps, did all this other stuff. And then when I got out of the Marine Corps, I sort of just was looking for an artistic therapeutic outlet, I suppose. And drawing just really didn't do it for me anymore. So I started sculpting wood, which eventually came, you know, became arrows and bows. And uh, that, that became an artistic outlet that uh, I was really passionate about. And I just uh, ran with it. That is so cool. How something from a young age really shows its head again in like just in a different form. Yeah. Yeah. That that is really cool, man. So uh, talk about that a little bit. Talk about what it is that you're doing um, with bows. Like, what do you got going on for the guys who don't know you personally? So I'm the owner of a company called Organic Archery, where we, well, we, I'm a one-man operation, but the, where I make custom uh, handcrafted primitive long bows and wooden arrows. So nice. it's all locally sourced. Um, I harvest all of the trees myself uh, here in Southeast Nebraska. So it's locally sourced. I work with uh, some of the local farmers who are either bulldozing their land for monocropping operations, or they're also community deforestation projects in the local area where uh, they'll be removing invasive species from our native walnut and oak forests. So I can either go in before the farmers bulldozers or before the deforestation project and take out some of these invasive species that actually happen to make excellent bows so it's just a uh, kind of a win-win for everybody. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I cut them all myself. I process them all myself. They season right here in the shop. And then I follow everyone from standing tree to finish bow. And, uh, wow. I converted, I have a two car garage that's detached from the house and, uh, we don't park any cars in there. I've converted it fully into a, an, a bow making shop. So wow. that's where I work from. <laughs> Dude, and, uh, that's amazing. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, um, I did it pretty obsessively as a hobby for about six or seven years before I finally made it my full-time endeavor. I was working full-time, uh, all day long and I would come home and build bows all through the night. And I did that for about six years. And, uh, then it got to the point where there was some sort of recognition on the internet and my page was growing and order volume was growing. And I had to make a choice between either quit making bows for, for as a business model or quit Mm -hmm. my job. So. I quit my job and went all in and I've been full-time since 2018. Wow. I, I commend you uh, for taking that step. 
and for doing something that really a, a lot of guys um, our age aren't doing just out of fear um, or just even out of the lack of passion and, and vision, right? Clear vision. Uh, because here you are understanding, hey, I'm actually pretty good at something uh, and somebody's willing to pay me for this. And yeah, I can go on living this comfortable lifestyle with, you know, making all the money that I'm making right now, or I can really just kind of drop, pull back a little bit and be, become my own boss, man. I'm, I definitely envy you right now in that. Um, and I hope to follow in your footsteps here soon. <laughs> man, that, that's amazing. I, I'm figuring since you're doing this all yourself, the, the process is pretty intense. Just, I mean, for our listeners, uh, we actually canceled our first or had to reschedule from our first meeting. Cause you were like, Hey, I actually have to go and cut some trees. Like you're, you're no kidding. Like going to do this yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so pretty intimate and time consuming process. But at the end of the day, like it's a finished product that you made with your hands. Like talk about that process a little bit, uh, it, really in the sense of what it does to you in you, like watching something go from raw product to finished product and uh, some of just what you feel inside, man. I think the reason that I like to follow everything from the standing tree to finish bow is probably just uh, so that I know for certain that there are no outside factors that would affect the finished product. And also I kind of, just have a connection with the tree and yeah. therefore a connection with the bow that's finished because, you know, I'm taking great care to go out into the forest with all my equipment, kind of carefully select each tree, um, really try to only take what I need or, you know, make, let the tree kind of speak to me, envision the bows that are inside of it. And then fell, fell the tree process the entire thing. And then it's just uh, kind of, individualized care all the way to the finished product. And it really makes me feel connected to the finished product. I really care about how they turn out. Um, I, I go to obsessive lengths uh, when finishing the products to make sure that they're, you know, as they're long lasting and completely free of, you know, any sort of imperfections like tool marks, or sanding marks. I mean, I go through a painstaking amount of detail to make sure that they look like art when they're finished. And it, it really just makes me feel connected to the bow. And yeah. I also allow the customers uh, to follow their entire process through Instagram tags. So yeah. that really kind of allows the customer to sort of start building a relationship in the weeks prior to them actually owning the bow, they get to see it go from a raw stave to a finished product. And that really gets them excited about the, you know, receiving the work at the end of the process. So that is cool. I don't know, man. It just makes me feel connected to my customers and it makes me feel connected to the finished product. And that's what I like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I know that you don't mean that the tree is like literally speaking to you, but for like the non-artistic guys, like I'm just picturing like a Michelangelo type of connection, right? As you're looking at this uh, raw product, right? I'm thinking Michelangelo with like a rock and it's like, no, I see uh, the thing in the rock already, I just have to remove the excess pieces, right? The, the things that are covering that artwork. Um, and that, I mean, I, I'd like to believe that I have a little bit of an artistic uh, bone in my body. Um, and, and I get that, man, but like that right there, everything you just explained seems so like, and requires so much devotion. And it seems so time consuming that to a world that might value, automization, immediate immediacy, right? Like immediate gratification. That's like, yeah, man, that's why that's a lost art, right? Like nobody is really shooting with bows anymore. Uh, now yeah. we have crossbows, <laughs> you know, but here you are like, no, man, this is my, this is my, a life passion so much so that I've given my life over to this thing. Um, and I'm doing this full time and I'm doing it in a way that not a lot of people are, man, I, I commend you for stepping forward. What, what do you have to say? Um, I think there's a shift. There's a, there's definitely a shift happening in our culture where we're starting to realize that it's just not sustainable for us to be mass producing junk products for yeah. mindless consumption. So you definitely see a resurgence of people valuing, you know, American made products or, or small businesses or craftsmen. Um, and I think that's definitely here to stay. 
I mean, you can see what's happening with the supply chain issues with all of this, uh, whatever's happening with China. I really don't follow the news. I just know that like I've had major issues sourcing raw materials uh, that have been sourced overseas. And so, I mean, I've just decided to completely detach myself from that as well and make every part of the every piece of the, you know, wow. product from scratch. So even the, the bladed broadheads and things like that. And it's just to fully separate myself from the supply chains of things that are being sourced overseas and cheaply manufactured. So yeah, I think there's a shift and I think, uh, I think people are really starting to see the value in, you know, handcrafted goods that have an outstanding warranty and, uh, people who build a relationship with their customers and stand behind yeah. their products and it is very time consuming and uh, it can be stressful at times, but uh, it's all worth it. Yeah, I think uh, God has provided for me. And I just when I think, you know, maybe I can't take it anymore. Or I'm feeling kind of tired. Yeah, he'll just give me a little nudge in the right direction and something amazing will happen. And yeah, it keeps me going. So that's cool, man. That is so cool. It, I think you're right about the shift because I'm looking around right now at the type of feedback that I'm getting, even just from this podcast. And I think there would have been a time where most people like just have their heads down on what they're doing and they're just focused and we'll just go, 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 go. And right now I feel like, you know, if you can imagine an entire crowd of guys, just like heads down, maybe faces in the phone, like there's just some guys who are just starting to pop their heads up and look around and see like, wait a minute, what have, what have I been missing out on? Um, wait a minute. Am I really going in the path that I even want to go? right? Like I'm making assumptions here, but in the small town that you're at, like, I'm guessing you have farms around you, like cows are somewhere near you. Yeah. Like yeah. you've never seen a cow, correct me if I'm wrong, take off on a full sprint. No. Right? Cows yeah. don't do that, right? Like cows wander <laughs> from one feeding ground to the next feeding ground to the next feeding ground. Right. And I feel like that's what so many men have been doing, just wandering through life finding the next patch of grass that's going to satisfy that immediate need, that immediate hunger, just to find out that that thing's going to run out and they're going to need to go a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more before you know it. Yeah. A cow can go a distance, but it never was purposeful. <laughs> right? Like yeah. that thing was never taken off to get there. Um, but I feel like there is a shift, man. And that's, that's the most interesting part about uh, being uh, part of this podcast, just engaging with men the way that I have been with coaching uh, and with this men's ministry, because guys are really, wanting feedback guys are wanting got other men in their corner to say, Hey, can you just like, show me what you know, um, and point me to the way, uh, point me to Yahweh. Right. Yeah. And I think one of the things, man, and I said to you before, when we started recording, like, I'd really want to pull out from this conversation is something unique about you. Um, just a unique opportunity to, that you had to be on the show alone. Um, because I feel like, although we don't find ourselves in a place where we need to go out there and you know hunt fish and gut and process meat like just knowing that you can and understanding those fundamentals and having those basics behind you, like in your back pocket right as tools equips a man with a type of confidence that you can't find anywhere else am i wrong no definitely i think like you said lead me to the way lead me to yahweh i mean Nate, God is nature and, 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 and you will have more lessons from God in your alone time in nature than you will almost anywhere else. Yeah. It just is a deeper connection to the entire creation. And yeah. so I don't think that anyone can receive anything bad from spending more time in nature and learning more basic, you know, self-reliance skills. Yeah. It's going to get you out there. It's going to make you feel more capable in yourself as a man, as a, and as a leader. And right. also just connect you to the creation. Right. Now, going to uh, your time on the show, by the way, I think everybody wonders, like, how real is this show? Right. It, it, I think people think when they when you watch this, because my wife literally kept telling me, why are you, you know, why are you watching this? Why are you watching this? You know, it's made <laughs> up. I'm like, babe, it is not made up. These people are out there freezing their butts off. Yeah. <laughs> I have to say it is not made up. That show is 100% legit and it's, it's challenging for certain. Um, it's what I, I suppose most people consider the Olympics of survival. Yeah. And, uh, 
It's all self-filmed. There's absolutely no camera crew. They send you to a self-filming school in New York before you go so you can learn how to operate all the cameras. And, no way. Uh, yep. You are literally flown away, miles away from civilization, uh, miles away from base camp into the wilderness via helicopter and dropped off. Yeah. And they say, good luck. You've got your survival items and you start from scratch <laughs> and just figure it out. <laughs> that is crazy. That is good. I'm, okay. I'm going to play this little clip right here to my wife as soon as we get done with this conversation. <laughs> be like, I told you so. <laughs> yeah, okay. So you're, you're dropped in to this remote location in the middle of, you know, somewhere in Alaska. And like, you're, you're, what's your first thought? Well, there have been seasons past. Uh, there was a, a contestant, Barry, from season six, who in the Arctic as well, which is where I was in the Northwest Territories, yes. who uh, coined the term drop shock. So mm. it's a lot like that. The helicopter flies away and you're, you're just almost in shock. I mean, it's a huge adrenaline dump. You're looking around. There's nothing, nothing but wilderness. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's confusing. You have to kind of sit down for you know, five or 10 minutes and just take a few deep breaths and really gather your bearing. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a big, it's a, yeah, it's a huge adrenaline dump and <laughs> definitely shocking when you first, when you first land. Right. I think I, if I were to put myself in that situation, I would want to think that I'm like, okay, I have prepared so much for this. Like I'm ready. I can go, but like, I, I know that there's going to be the first, you know, initial doubts, initial fears. What were some of yours? I think my initial fear after f flying over my area was because uh, you kind of get an aerial view of the of the the land that you're going to be dropped in from the helicopter, and I think my first fear was certainly um, shelter. Shelter. I was I was on the side of a very large hill, a huge granite rock slide, very rough terrain, mm. uh, lots of rocks, not really any dirt anywhere. Uh, the trees were a lot smaller than I expected. So my, my immediate concern was, am I going to be able to build a shelter out here yeah. in this location? One that, oh. you know, is going to get me through an Arctic winter. Yeah. But you, but you said, Hey, I'm taking this challenge. Like you could have had, could you have just tapped right there? Not even been inserted like, Hey, never mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> been I mean, a huge upset. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I never, I never would have allowed myself to do that, but, uh, <laughs> you can definitely over-prepare like you were, you were, you mentioned that a moment ago. Uh, really? Yes. I, I, I would say that I definitely over-prepared for the challenge. Um, because as soon as you drop, I mean, I spent obsessive hours planning and built and thinking up different designs for all these different shelters I was going to build Yeah, and, uh, how I was going to fish and how I was going to hunt. And as soon as I got dropped in my location, all of that went out the window. It was all wow. just improvis improvisation and you had to, I mean, everything, my shelter, my fishing and my hunting was, was all just improv. So yeah, I think the most important thing is to know your basics, fishing, trapping, animal processing, shelter building and fire yeah. and the rest, just, just wing it. <laughs> just wing it right yeah. on. <laughs> well, you know, I think this, there's a, a president, uh, I forgot which one it is. Uh, he said, you know, plan, I'm oh, sorry. Yeah. Plans are nothing. Planning is everything. And really it gets to the point that the plan that you are formulating, it's not going to survive first contact. And we know that, yeah. but the fact that you are taking the time to plan, that's what is the pro move because you are taking the time to be like, to deliberately plan through and think through some of the things that you could do, right? So maybe you didn't do any of the designs that you planned, right? And you over-prepared, mm -hmm. but at least you thought them through versus not even, you know, giving it the time of day, right? Definitely. So then as you progress, you know, a couple of days in, um, I'm trying to get to really some of the challenges uh, that, that young men don't get to uh, engage in today, just because, I mean, we don't have like, a remote forest in our backyards, right? A lot of us don't. Yeah. As you progress a couple of days in, like what are some of the things that you felt like were being tested inside of you um, initially that you're like, I did not expect this? Definitely um, what would be considered, I suppose, extreme fasting. Um, 
because I'm, I practice intermittent fasting and sometimes okay. I'll do, you know, 24 to 48 hour fasts if I'm in the okay. mountains or something like that, or very, very low calories with uh, high energy expenditure, but I've never in my life went, you know, eight days without food because I was really focused on my shelter for the first week that I was there. And it didn't yeah. end up airing on the show, but I told my camera every day, like, listen, I'm not hunting. I'm not fishing. I'm not worried about food at all. I want to take the calories that I have reserved in my body to get the shelter locked in. And then I'll worry about food. And um, I think within the first eight days, all I ate was a squirrel, which out there is worth about a hundred to 150 calories of just protein. So very low uh, wow. energy food source. And uh, that was hunger. Like I had not experienced before. Yeah. And, and I mean, just the effects on your body, it starts to feel after about seven days without food, it just starts to feel like you're walking through mud everywhere you go. Your legs just get heavy. Yeah. Uh, you just, you breathe hard. It's just, your body's got nothing to fuel itself. Wow. But the testing is there, right? And you're much better today because of it. Absolutely. Also, well, I mean, yeah, go ahead. One of the benefits, though, is just this unbelievably heightened sense, unbelievably heightened senses, smell, hearing, vision is all I really mean, it, I think it's an ancient, uh, you know, mechanism inside of our DNA that says, uh, you know, we haven't had meat in a while. It's time to kick into, you know, advanced hunter mode. <laughs> yeah, really. So you can smell things that you've never smelled before. You're yeah, everything's just hypersensitive. And that was really cool to experience. Is that like a known thing that it, has that been studied before? Well, alone is the biggest study con ever conducted on isolation in the wilderness and uh, wilderness starvation. And I believe that uh, there will be some books about it in the future from the research from the show. But uh, yeah, I think it's pretty well documented that uh, everyone from the show experiences extremely heightened senses and it lasts wow. quite some time. Really? Like you you'll be kept like I was kept awake at night by the sound of my heartbeat because it was just so loud. I could actually hear the blood moving through my veins. It was very distracting. Um, wow. And after I got home, it was probably, it was probably one or two weeks before I could sleep because I could hear the electricity buzzing and the wires in the walls. So oh, man, that's and also nice. just yeah, think about the that. overstimulation that we have in our everyday society too. Right. I think, I think we shut off like 95% of our environment just as a survival mechanism. You have to. Yeah. Yeah. If I were to turn on every single thing and heighten it, like you're talking about, I, I would be overwhelmed. I'd have like sensory overload. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember I was in the back, uh, the boundary waters in Minnesota. It's like between Minnesota and Canada. And me and my buddy just said, Hey, we're just going to canoe for a day. And that's what we did. We did. And man, I never had been in a place that was that quiet, except for an, an, uh, in the air. So I parachuted before. Once you open the parachute, super quiet. You don't hear anything from the ground. But also taking a day trip into the wilderness, um, you, like no man-made sounds for an entire day. I could see yeah. how everything gets really loud really quick right after that. Definitely. So what are some of the experiences that you feel like were were crucial during that time that you can point to and say, Hey, I am a better man today because of that one thing. This one thing happened. It's like, ah, I either proved this to myself or I disproved this. Is there anything that, that comes to mind? There are two pretty important lessons that I learned out there. Um, the first being that I'm not invincible and I can get, you know, ridiculous injuries that are un unexpected, just like everybody else. I've yeah. never in my life had, I've had some serious injuries. I've had some minor surgeries, but I've never had anything that injured me badly enough to take away some sort of opportunity yeah. or take me out of the game for a long period of time. Yeah. Uh, so when I got injured out there, um, yeah, it ended up being pretty serious. I tore my MCL and my meniscus and it ended up being over a year recovery. And it was just kind of a reality check that, uh, my body can break too. Wow. And, um, that was very humbling for me. Wow. And I think the second most important lesson is that, uh, human beings are not meant to be in extreme isolation for long periods of time. Ooh, I want to get to that. Oh, that's good. Well, okay. I want to get to that, <laughs> but I do want to say, this is again, going back to that battle between like, is this stuff real? Like, come on now. I remember you talking about how 
you know, you, you kind of like, did, is it that you like slipped or something? Is that how the initial injury happened? Yeah, it was probably day three or so. And I was carrying a large piece of timber on my shoulder yep. for my, the, I used the larger timbers for my bed frame inside yep. the shelter because I had a very limited number of large trees. So I wanted them to right. go to good use. And right. uh, I was carrying one of the larger timbers on my shoulder and I slipped. The terrain is very, very slippery. Right. Uh, the rocks are covered in moss and lichen and it's just like ice. It'll take your feet right out from under you. And that and was shown, the, right? Um, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's, the, that, that first, like you, you falling, that was a, that was a clip that was shown, correct? It was shown. Yeah. Yeah. Cause um, then a, a couple of days went by and you're like, man, this is not getting better. Actually it's swelling. Right. A little while went by. Am, am I remember that correctly? Yeah, that's correct. I, I heard a, an audible pop in my knee and I knew that was bad, but it really didn't hurt me at the time. I was kind of, you know, sort of just engaged in my activities and probably had a lot of butt blood pumping through my legs because I'd been hauling right. timber all day. So I right. didn't really feel it carried on, uh, ended up being pretty obsessive about the shelter for like another two days after that. So I yeah. really didn't pay that much attention to it. I mean, it kind of bothered me a little bit, but nothing that I ever thought would have evolved. And then as soon as I got the shelter completed and there was a little bit more downtime, like building my fishing nets and building my fishing gear mm -hmm. and uh, getting my trap lines set up, uh, that downtime was when the swelling really started to kick in. And yeah. uh, by probably about day five or six, there was a large fluid pocket starting to build. And then by day probably eight or nine, I started to lose stability in my leg and it would just give out randomly, which yeah. is it's hard enough to survive out there as it is yep. and it's dangerous enough as, as it is with the terrain being so slippery. So having a knee that you can't fully rely on really multiplies the risks. Yeah. And, uh, by day, like by night number nine, I was starting to get fevers in my sleep and yeah. uh, it was starting to get so sore that if I would bump my MCL area with my other leg while I was asleep, it would wake mm -hmm. me up out of a dead sleep. So I just, uh, I wrote it out as long as I could. And I, I one more day myself to day 12 and then I had to call it. I yeah. mean, I, I, I wasn't getting sleep. And if you do not get sleep in the wilderness, you'll deteriorate so quickly within 48 hours without sleep. I mean, you, you can start to have some serious health effects. Yeah. And lasting health effects too. That's one of the most dangerous parts. Like it, guys go in there and there's so much, so much like machismo, right? Like I'm a man. I'm going to do it. I got, I got chosen for this. I'm one of 10 and I'm going to be the number one guy. I'm going to make it to day hundred. But then you're looking at yourself and you're like, man, actually, if I'm not smart right now, this could ruin things down in my, in my forties. And then why, right? Like then Absolutely. how much of a man am I really? That was what ended up pulling me out. You have a lot of time to think out there. I mean, you, you're just sitting by yourself, you have a camera to talk to sort of as a journal, you know, but, uh, you work through a lot of stuff about your life and your future and everything. And I started to think if, you know, I have this active lifestyle that I really enjoy. I love going to the gym. I love going hiking. I love going hunting. Um, what am I going to do if I cause enough permanent damage into here to where maybe I'm starting to have major surgeries, multiple surgeries, maybe my knee never fully mm -hmm. recovers. Yeah. And your knees are a pretty important piece of gear. So, I, uh, I just decided that it wasn't worth it, not for yeah. a television show Yeah, for no, me to point. risk, you know, my active lifestyle for potentially the rest of my life, man. But, uh, also going back to the, to the man thing, like, yeah, you're, you're man, you go out there with a bunch of machismo. Like I'm going to show this place what I'm about. You are nothing compared to mother <laughs> nature. She will crush you. Like if you go out there with an attitude that you're going to show mother nature, what's up, you will yeah, lose yeah. every single time. Oh my goodness. She uh, can kill you in a single night if she wants to. You so gotta humble you have yourself. To, absolutely. Nature <laughs> will humble you. You don't have to humble yourself. Yeah, She'll do yeah. it for you. Yeah. I mean, well, in the Bible, it says there's only two types of people. There's like those who are humble or those who will be humbled. So absolutely. Which, which one are you? <laughs> <laughs> Man. Okay. So one of the other things that you brought up um, was the fact that really you went right to Genesis. Like man was not made to be alone. <laughs> it just, For sure. I, I could only imagine, man, I, 
I'm such a talkative person. I have to have somebody around me to listen to me externally process what's going on. (laughs) But I couldn't imagine just like extreme. I think for the first two days, it'd be cool. And then after that, it'd get really old. And then after like day four for me, I'd start panicking. Like, ooh, there's nobody. Um, Yeah. So why is it that you say like you learned, you took that away? Like, hey, you are not designed to be alone. I mean, there, there's plenty of research that backs it up. There's a reason it's illegal to keep prisoners in solitary confinement for more than like 10 to 12 days. You know, I mean, the psychological effects are, are pretty severe. And uh, there are definitely contestants of the show who have lasted much longer than me, who have lasting psychological effects that they, you know, they may have to deal with for one or two years post-production, really? you know, trying to get themselves reacclimated to normal life. Some people handle it very well. Some people go through a lot of trouble out there being alone that long. Wow. wow. But uh, I think it, it just becomes obvious. It just becomes obvious. Yeah. yeah. You, it, it doesn't feel natural. I mean, it does feel good. There's definitely a period like that first, like you said, two days, three days, it feels cool. Then there's a period of time like around the, maybe the fifth to the eighth day where you're like, wow, this is really intense. And there's a lot of internal, like we don't take much time in our society. Now we're constantly distracted. We're constantly looking at screens. Every waking moment of your life is filled with some sort of distraction, whether it's your phone, TV, books, cars, gym, like, you're always doing something every waking moment of your life. So when you have all this time to sit down and think, yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, you're working through a lot there in those, you know, around day four to eight. And then after like day eight to 10, you really settle into a groove and you're like, okay, this isn't so bad. Like I just have to occupy myself and it's lonely and you think about home and stuff like that, but it, it really, it's a, it's a phase that passes for sure. Unfortunately for me, it passed, you know, around the time that I'm I'm realizing I'm not going to be able to continue. Yeah. Yeah. The mental struggle was, it was a factor, but I mean, I thought I was, I was golden until the injury progressed. Now, if you were given the chance to go back and take another man with you, do you think it would even be a challenge to get through it? I think it would still be a challenge, but it would be, it would be much, much less of a challenge just doing yeah. everything yourself. And also the camera gear makes survival time times 10 more difficult. Mm-hmm. Like you're self-filming a TV show and that's what you're being paid to be there for. You know, that is your, like, there's, there's certain rules about the show. Like you have to film a certain amount. So you're there to create a television show. You can't just yeah. sit around and survive. Right. Um, so not only are you, you know, walking down to the shore to, check your gill nets you're walking down to the shore setting up your camera walking back for the shot walking back to the shore to get the shot walking back to the camera to get the cameras like it's just (laughs) constantly moving cameras around there's tons of gear involved batteries constantly needing changed just uh it it really makes it times 10 worse so if you had another person there who could film you while you're doing stuff and you could return the favor and there's two bodies to carry things two bodies to check traps um, it would definitely still be a challenge. You'd have somebody to talk to. Yeah. Um, it would be, I mean, there was one season of alone, I believe it might've been season four ish somewhere in there where they actually did family pairs. And, okay. uh, I didn't see that. Yeah, they did. I mean, they did great out there, yeah. but, uh, it wasn't very well received by the audience. I don't think because the show is called alone. So sure. sure. Yeah. And, and I asked that because man, like in life, Right. If we were to look at the parallels, like I think a lot of times we try to go at something alone, either because of the bravado, you know, that sense that like I'm going to accomplish this thing. I'm going to be a self made man. I'm going to do it. Right. Or just wanting to see if you have it in you, which is fine. Like every man needs to, needs to know that he has what it takes. But then at the same time, knowing that there's that you could have another guy in your corner or another guy with you that could, help you along the way or be right there to championing the champion, this thing with you. Right. And, and tackle these hard challenges with you. I think it makes all of the difference. Would you agree? Absolutely. I think yeah. it's so important in life uh, in general, just to surround yourself with, you know, uplifting and, uh, and inspiring male role models or male yeah. peers. Yeah. It just, uh, it's beneficial on so many fronts. Brother, how can guys, 
either get a hold of you, first of all, see your products um, and connect with you? So um, I'm only on one social media platform right now. So the best place to connect with me is um, at Corey Hawk on Instagram, C-O-R-R-E-Y-H-A-W-K. Um, and otherwise, if they want to see my work and kind of see how the process um, works, they can go to my website, www.organicarchery.com. I have some extensive galleries of my work on there. Um, I'm also doing classes now. So people can connect by coming over and hanging out at my shop for three days where we will build primitive longbows from start to finish. And then we'll eat some great food while everybody's here. And uh, it's really been awesome. I'm super happy about these classes. I've got to meet some great men and women. Yeah. And uh, by the end of the three days, you know, we leave as friends. Everybody leaves with a great bow. We shoot yeah. all day on the third afternoon. So we go play some archery games and stuff like that. So yeah, if you want to come hang out in person and build a bow, look on my website at the classes page and come build a longbow if they want. Otherwise, just uh, hit me up on Instagram. 